Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Stephen Ross. Uh, Steve is a research associate professor of psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. He's a Penn alumni. He, he graduated undergraduate at Penn, completed his medical degree at UCLA so he can get some sun, uh, did his psychiatry residency at Columbia, and then his addiction fellowship at NYU. So he's well versed to give uh, lots of lectures for us. He's a founding member of the NYU Psychedelic Research Group and is currently associate director of the NYU Lagone Health Center for Psychedelic Medicine and director of the NYU uh, Psy uh, Psychedelic Medicine Research Training Program. He served as uh, director of the Division of Alcoholism on uh, Drug Abuse in the Psychiatry Department at Bellevue for 12 years, director of addiction uh, psychiatry at NYU Tisch Hospital and director of NYU Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. Um, he has a, a number of uh, grants as PI or co-PI, and we're very thrilled to have him uh, give us a lecture on his recent research. And the title of his talk is Psilocybin Assisted Psychotherapy to Treat Psychiatric and Existential Distress in Palliative Care. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us. Thank Marty, you thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Is everybody seeing that? Yes, looks good. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, <clears throat> so yeah, it, it's a real honor for me to be here today. Um, well, for a number of reasons, including that I went to Penn undergrad um, many years ago, majored in the biological basis of behavior, and that really got me interested in neuroscience and psychiatry uh, and have a really fond place for Penn in my heart. But also because my son Jacob is a freshman at Penn now, and he's living in the quad, same place I live. So uh, it, it's a real honor and privilege for me to, to talk today. So I initially was gonna talk about the use of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat alcohol use disorder. Uh, and there's a study that uh, Michael Bogenschutz and I recently completed at NYU that took about seven years, but <clears throat> That paper is under review, and so as not to jeopardize it, uh, decided instead to talk about another program of research that I've been involved with for the last 16 years, and that's the use of um, psychedelics <clears throat> combined with psychotherapy to treat psychiatric distress like anxiety and depression and existential distress like death anxiety in patients that have uh, life-threatening uh, medical illnesses. The focus has been on advanced cancer. And I'm going to talk today about that program of research, its history, the work we've done, and the future in this area. In terms of disclosures, um, this is my active research funding. Uh, I am working with Marty Cheadle on a, um, a NIDA-funded grant studying CBD patients that have chronic radicular pain who are on opioids. So one of my uh, research areas of interest is the intersection between pain and addiction. Uh, and, and these other entities sponsor psilocybin uh, research. So the class of drugs we're talking about are the classic psychedelics or the serotonergic psychedelics. There's typically two different varieties. There's the indole alkalamines. The ring structure here is very similar to serotonin. And they include the tryptamines, which includes psilocybin and, and DMT which is found in ayahuasca. Uh, the lysergamides are in this category. Um, and then we have the phenyl alkalamines. The prototype here is peyote. These are more of the amphetaminergic psychedelics. The ring structure of peyote is, uh, and these uh, class, subclass of psychedelics is similar to norepinephrine. I include ibogaine here knowing that ibogaine has pretty weak activity at the 2A receptor and has a whole other host of interesting pharmacologic properties. Ibogaine's uniqueness is that it appears to help opiate withdrawal, making it unique among uh, psychedelic type drugs. So very brief history, psychedelics have been used by indigenous cultures for thousands of years for religious and spiritual purposes. One of the ways they have been used is to aid in the process of death and dying. <clears throat> and then the first wave of psychedelic research started very serendipitously in 1943, when Albert Hoffman, a Swiss uh, chemist who was working on ergot derivatives to help uh, with vasoconstriction during uh, women that were hemorrhaging during pregnancy, accidentally gets this 
lysergamide number 25 that he had synthesized uh, some, some maybe through his skin or his eye and has the first LSD experience, which is a pretty bad one. He goes home and he becomes what sounds like acutely psychotic, thinking that he is possessed by a demon, that his neighbor is a witch. He calls his physician, convinced he's dying. The physician can find nothing wrong with him medically, sleeps it off, wakes up the next day feeling renewed, refreshed, that things look novel and interesting, and realizes he's made a very uh, powerful discovery. Um, Sandoz then uh, tests LSD in animals. They test it on participants and they market it and make it available uh, legally, uh, Delhi said, and they ship it to psychiatrists and researchers throughout the world. And it starts this first phase of research, which goes on for the next uh, quarter century or so. And it becomes a big part of psychiatry. There's several APA conferences dedicated to psychedelics. They become touted as this wonder drug that's gonna you know, help us understand the biological basis of psychosis aid psychoanalytic psychotherapy and, and sort of treat many neuropsychiatric disorders. At the end of this um, long era, there's over a thousand studies published. There's tens of thousands of participants. The most promising indication is the use of LSD, and it's predominantly LSD. Very little was done with psilocybin. The most promising area was the treatment of alcohol use disorder, followed by, um, psychiatric distress, existential distress, and pain in terminal cancer syndromes. Um, but when I was a, a medical student and a trainee in psychiatry, general psychiatry and addiction psychiatry, I learned nothing about this interesting history. It became completely erased because the drugs got caught up in the counterculture movement. They escaped the laboratory. They were used indiscriminately, and all of the unsafe things we know associated with unprepared, indiscriminate psychedelic use occurred, including things like psychosis, dangerous behavior, psychiatric hospitalization. But the biggest threat was the threat to the establishment of the political order at the time. And Richard Nixon really thought this was dangerous um, and declared war on drugs said that Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in America. Timothy Leary was a Harvard professor who had been kicked out of Harvard and become like the Pied Piper of psychedelics. And the Controlled Substance Act, which we have known over the last many decades, was born. And uh, it effectively halted all research into psychedelics and erased from the history books that they were even part of psychiatry. I think this history is important because we're kind of in this new second phase of psychedelic research. We're in the kind of uh, exuberance or rational exuberance phase. And unless we're good students of history, you know, bad things can repeat themselves. Um, clinical work or human work with psychedelics started in the early 90s with Rick Straussman at New Mexico doing IV DMT studies. And then over the last several decades, a group of laboratories in the United States and Europe have been conducting psychedelic research, including at Johns Hopkins and UCLA, and our group that has been involved in this area of research since 2006. So at the, at the end of the first era, there was this interesting, very interesting model where uh, instead of one therapist, you had two therapists per one patient, you had this real wraparound psychotherapy around the intervention with lots of preparation with two therapists, skilled therapists, with the model, predominant model coming to be this, that uh, after being carefully um, screened and reviewing the participants, let's say, you know, problems around cancer and confrontation with death, preparing them for, to have a safe experience, the default is they take the pill, lie supine, or given eye shades, pre-selected music, and focus internally. It's this model that we've adapted or that most of us have adapted. And then after, there's a lot of post-integrative psychotherapy to help make sense and integrate the experience. So it was this interesting model. I, I learned nothing about this in my training where we're used to one patient, one psychiatrist, typical 45-minute session. The terminology with psychedelics has kind of been interesting and, and kind of all over the place. My 
favorite term, which is about as good as any, was Fantastica. This is coined by Louis Lewin, the famed uh, German psychopharmacologist, one of the fathers of psychopharmacology, who uh, self-ingested with mescaline and wrote Fantastica. Psychotomimetic was a term that described um, the property of psychedelics that is akin to acute psychotic-like states. And, and in fact, this, this uh, line of thinking helped um, come up with the atypical antipsychotics, which are all 5-HT2A antagonists. So there's definitely something about these compounds in producing acute psychotic-like phenomena. Psychedelic is a kind of vague term coined by Humphrey Osmond, meaning mind manifesting. Uh, it's become sort of a term that's now commonly used. Um, but for a long time, it was hallucinogen, that which produces hallucinations. Although this term is um, not totally accurate because psychedelics cause more illusions rather than true hallucinations, but they certainly can. And then this component, their ability to produce mystical states of consciousness, this was a very new to me. And this is a kind of strange thing in medicine to be talking about mysticism. It's really should be, you know, in religion. But being an addiction psychiatrist, I, I knew all about spirituality and mystical states as they pertain to recovery. So it was not totally new to me. But in the domain of end of life illness, um, mystical experiences can potentially be helpful. But what I had learned about psychedelics in my traditional textbooks is that they induce psychosis, that they produce disturbances of thought content and thought processes that really are akin to psychosis. What I had never learned is that they produce these unusual states that have been described in different branches of the Abrahamic religions and which psychology has studied for the last 40 years and developed validated scales. So mystical experience has to do with a sense of uh, unity of consciousness that all energy and matter is one and that we're all interconnected. And if you look at sort of astrophysics in a way that that is true, we all are, all energy is indestructible and interconnected in some way. These experiences can lead to a transcendence of time and space. They can, uh, participants can report this deeply felt positive mood. Often our uh, cancer patients in our study would describe being in touch with some profound infinite love uh, that some describe as God's love. There can be a sense of these being very sacred experiences, this concept of inspiring reality. William James, the father of American psychology, came up with the idea of noetics, these sort of very profound philosophical and psychological insights where people can feel like they've been in touch with really true or ultimate reality. These experiences can be very difficult to describe. One participant said, well, how can I describe infinity? How could I even come close? Um, the experiences, uh, there can be paradoxical elements and uh, transient. And Walter Stacy was the first to describe uh, these states. And again, there's now validated scale, the MEQ that we use to measure mystical experience, which I'll return to later in the talk in describing the, this unique experience as a, a potential kind of candidate psychological mechanism of action of these drugs. In terms of their molecular neuropharmacology, um, we know that the serotonin system is very important. We know the 2A system is, is the key, especially to the subjective effects, and that if you block this receptor, let's say by using catanserin, you block all of their subjective effects. But these, this class of drugs also activates the 2B and 2C system. 2B is uh, important because we know 2B activation is involved with valvulopathies. We found this out with the drug uh, fenfluramine. So there is a theoretical risk that chronically giving 2B agonists could lead to valvulopathy. We've not yet seen that with psychedelics, but maybe with microdosing, who knows, maybe you'd start to see something like that. And they also are 5-HT1A agonists. But in addition to the 2A system, they also have effects on the glutamatergic system and, uh, and neurotrophic effects. So there's a co-location of glutamate um, receptors and, and serotonin 2A receptors on layer 5 pyramidal 
neurons. And so uh, 2A agonism increases glutamate activity, uh, and you end up getting uh, AMPA and NMDA activation and BDNF expression. And, and this is, um, some people think that this is really where these drugs work. It's their effects on neuroplasticity that's really at the heart of why they may work across various neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, they're also dopaminergic, but interestingly, unlike all of the other drugs of abuse that are addictive, they're, they don't have pronounced dopaminergic properties, and they don't appreciably activate the, the VTA to nucleus accumbens. Uh, and so it, in some ways they, they lack, and I'll show a slide in a minute talking about their addictive liability, but they don't appear to have sufficient dopaminergic properties to produce dependence and reinforcing syndromes. They also have adrenergic effects um, and they're sympathomimetic agents. Um, <clears throat> David Olson, at UC Davis uh, has coined a new class of drugs. He's calling them psychoplastogens or neuroplastogens. And ketamine was the very first drug that we found out had effects on structural and functional neuroplasticity. And it turns out the more we look that the serotonergic psychedelics also um, have these effects. And so David Olson, this is, these are uh, cortical cell cultures. And he gave different psychedelics, LSD, DMT, DOI. This is an amphetaminergic uh, psychedelic. And um, found that, that all of them uh, increased neurogenesis in terms of uh, increased uh, dendritic arborization. This is in prefrontal cortex. Found that they promote spinogenesis, uh, synaptogenesis, and that uh, there's a functional component here in terms of improving functional plasticity. So Olson really has honed in on this as kind of probably what he thinks if the, these drugs are therapeutic is their main effects, is that they are able to repair uh, synapses, synaptic connections in parts of the brain that mediate psychiatric disorders. So again, this is a supposition. And now there's this kind of raging debate in the field is it the subjective experience or is it these purely neurobiologic effects? And the answer is we don't even know whether they work or not. We're still too early stage. We first need to determine that they're efficacious and then we need to do studies to, to interrogate potential neurobiologic and psychospiritual mechanisms of action. The 2A receptor, if you block it, you can uh, block the effects of psychedelics on structural Plasticity, so it does appear to be in part mediated to the 2A system. And we know that downstream, even single doses of psychedelics can induce, induce gene expression and upregulate transcripts uh, that are in prefrontal cortex that are involved in synaptic plasticity. We, we know that these drugs have effects on BDNF that's involved in synaptic plasticity. There's even some evidence that they promote neurogenesis which theoretically opens up their use to be used in neurodegenerative disorders, but that's still very uh, speculative. And it appears that the BDNF effects are mediated by TRKB and mTOR. Um, and then the neuroimaging with psychedelics is, is interesting, and um, people have uh, looked at the acute effects of psychedelics um, on glucose metabolism, on bold signal, cerebral blood flow, and the techniques used have been SPECT, PET, fMRI. And there's been really two main models um, that have been proposed. The first was by Franz Bollenweider in Switzerland using PET, um, where he had a model of sort of decreased thalamic gating and hyperfrontality. And then Robin Carr Harris at Imperial College has developed a model of, of alterations in brain hub function. And he's kind of zeroed in on the default mode network as being important. But the caveats here, there have been few studies, the sample sizes are very small, and there's different methodologic approaches, different routes of administration, so the comparison is very difficult. Um, and, and what happens sometimes with neuroimaging is that the findings are very interesting, it's very interesting to peer into the brain, but 
the idea of what may be going on mechanistically is, is pure conjecture at this point, but very important to keep doing more of this research. So Franz Vollenweider, um, this was PET neuroimaging, this was psilocybin acute administration. He found activation in the prefrontal cortex, the temporal medial cortex. He found activation of the insula. And he sort of, um, he also found decreased thalamic activation and came up uh, with a model where sort of described these states to acute psychosis. And we know in schizophrenics that their ability to filter out irrelevant stimuli is impaired. And they, they have disruptions in thalamocortical signaling. And so maybe there's something going on uh, with that. Um, Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt have done work. This is with fMRI. And they found something quite different. They found an overall reduction in brain activity, both within brain networks and between brain networks. And they used fMRI, EEG, and MEG. And in particular, uh, Carr Harris focused on the default mode network, this uh, brain region. He found it to be deactivated and built a story around uh, the default mode network that it appears to be overactive in disorders of um, rumination like addiction and depression and, and thought that this may be a mechanism that underlines how they may work across different diagnostic entities, but it did conflict with the PET um, data. Um, and, and also, Carr Harris and, and others analyzed the data here and found that after acute disintegration of brain networks, there was a kind of reorganization into new networks and that it appeared that there was greater connectivity and, and, and sort of different parts of the brain talking to each other that don't normally talk to each other. And the idea here was that you had increased sort of plasticity, more distinct brain patterns compared to normal consciousness. In terms of the physiologic data, this in general is a very safe class of drugs from a physiologic medical perspective. Uh, psychedelics in general are not associated with organ damage. They're not carcinogenic. They're not teratogenic. They're not associated with overdose deaths as compared to something like opioids. They don't appear to have enduring neuropsychological deficits, including studies done in communities that use them a lot, like the Native American church, where it's legally used there. To some ex exceptions, Ibogaine has been associated with QT prolongation and torsades. And some of these very potent synthetic 2A agonists, like Bromo Dragonfly and NBOM, have been associated with some deaths. So some parallels here to synthetic cannabinoids being dangerous where, you know, the, the plant-derived ones have not been. The, the main adverse effects have to do with uh, adverse psychological effects. So people can have this anxious, terrifying reaction known as a bad trip. Uh, patients can have uh, acute psychotic-like phenomena. That's why you'd never want to give a drug like this to people with active psychosis or at risk for psychosis. There's the condition of HPPD, which has been described, which is extremely rare and has actually not been described in the research world when we do careful screening. And this concept of this is a Schedule One drug, so by definition, it must be, you know, very addictive. But uh, we'll look at the data there because that, that turns out to not be true. But if you look at the modern data in the last 20 years of psilocybin being used in clinical trials, from open label to randomized control trials and populations from normal volunteers to those with diseases like cancer and addiction. Um, there have been several hundred participants. There have been, at this point, uh, close to 600 doses administered of psilocybin. And interestingly, there have been no treatment-related SAEs in terms of medical toxicity, prolonged psychosis, HPPD, or addiction, and that it appears that with very careful screening and administration that they are safe to administer. So are these Schedule One drugs, do they really meet the criteria? Um, and, and I would argue that they were put into this category for political rather than scientific reasons. 
And if you look at them, and you know, all the addictionologists here are familiar that from preclinical to uh, population level studies, what makes a drug addictive is preclinically we know that animals will self-administer and continue to do that. Um, we know that they can induce con condition place preference. We know that the nucleus accumbens is very important if you do neuroimaging. And epidemiologically, you should see people that have use disorders. So this class of drugs appears to fail every one of these. They are not <clears throat> reliably um, uh, self-administered. They tend to not induce condition place preference. They don't robustly activate the nucleus accumbens having to do with their relative weak relatively weak dopaminergic effects. <clears throat> and epidemiologically, we don't really see, you know, addictive spectrum phenomena. They can be misused, they can be overused, they can be abused, they can cause real harm. Um, they also have enormous tachyphylaxis. So if you take a psychedelic for several days, the effects uh, really wear off completely. So, and they can produce these very difficult very challenging experiences. So they really do not act like addictive spectrum drugs, despite being in Schedule One. And if we would really make rational drug policy, you know, we'd start with the drugs that aren't scheduled, like tobacco and alcohol. And if we were, were looking at a rational drug policy, we'd look at something like this addictive or dependence potential uh, active dose versus lethal dose. And, and when we do this, we, we know that the most, you know, uh, damaging drugs in society are the opioids, alcohol, cocaine, nicotine. And it looks like the serotonergic psychedelics from a risk perspective are quite low. Another way you can look at it is damage to self and society. And again, when you look at it this way, it's typically the ones we know about that are the most damaging to society, including, you know, alcohol, which is legal. And the, the least problematic ones appear to be the serotonergic psychedelics. So <clears throat> I wanted to focus on cancer next and talk about psychiatric disorders in cancer. Uh, and for me as an addiction psychiatrist to kind of pivot in this direction was new. In fact, when I heard about this body of research and started um, a research group in 2006, I really wanted to continue the work with LSD and alcoholism but I soon was sort of, you know, pulled aside by a senior colleague and told there's no way you could ever start there. That LSD is too toxic of a drug in, you know, in the national consciousness and the scientific community and that the use of LSD to treat alcoholism would have created way too much cognitive dissonance. So the second most promising area in terms of psychiatric and existential distress and cancer, we decided to go in that direction, but I really had to educate myself a lot to understand the nature of the problem here. So it turns out that depression and anxiety uh, are quite common in cancer, and it can be end of life cancer and even early stage cancer, that the rates can be a third, 40%. We know that having untreated psychiatric distress uh, is associated with poor outcomes. Uh, including increased hastened desire for death, higher rates of completed suicide, and also adverse medical outcomes like decreased survival from cancer. So it's very consequential to have psychiatric distress in cancer. And the treatments tend to not work that great, that um, psychotherapy and meds are commonly used, but there's really not an accepted best practice algorithm of care. The effectiveness of the interventions is limited and mixed. And if you look in particular at meta-analyses of antidepressants to treat cancer-related major depression, they tend to not work any better than placebo. It doesn't mean they're not uh, used, they're commonly used, but they tend not to work that well for depression and cancer. Existential distress is also uh, really important to understand, especially as one contemplates death and end of life. Uh, and there are some that uh, there's a kind of spectrum of responsivity to being told you have cancer um, and you might die. And for some people, they cope with denial. Some cope by, it's like a, a gift for them. Certainly this happened to Viktor Frankl in the Holocaust where he and others were able to face the brutality of the concentration camps at Auschwitz 
And rather than giving up, they were able to find laughter and hope and, and joy and meaning. And Frankel was able to come up with logotherapy because of his experience. The first existential psychotherapy uh, in people with, with serious illness. But about half of people with advanced cancer will have some kind of existential distress as people contemplate death. And it can take the form of the demoralization syndrome, which I'll define in a minute. It can take the form of death anxiety. And there are many other forms that it takes that suddenly life has no more purpose or meaning. You lose your sense of dignity. Things feel futile. And the most important things um, sort of unwind, that people feel disconnected from sources of love, hope, connection, and spirituality. So this is a very bad place to be. Uh, David Kassane <clears throat> has defined the demoralization syndrome over the last 20 years. It's in the ICD-11, but has not yet found its way to the DSM-5. But it's a, it's a diagnosis uh, that certainly exists within psycho-oncology. Uh, it's probably similar to adjustment disorder, if we were to put it somewhere in the DSM. But it really has to do with poor coping in the face of a serious medical illness. There's an existential component where things become meaningless and pointless. It's marked by hopelessness and helplessness. And people feel sort of trapped, stuck. They're never going to get out of it. And that progresses to hasten desire for death and increase suicidality. So, um, and having existential distress like the demoralization syndrome, like psychiatric distress, is associated with bad outcomes, worsening of anxiety and depression, higher rates of suicide, and worsening of pain. So it, it too, can have really bad outcomes. Um, and we have no pharmacologic treatments to treat existential distress. So this is a really big unmet need in medicine, coming up with new treatments for psychiatric and existential distress in cancer. So I always ask this question, and when it was first posed to me by a colleague years ago, it, it really kind of gets you thinking, where do you want to die? And you know, I, when I was, um, it, it's when I did my medical training, I learned nothing about how to help somebody come to terms with death and have a good death. The medicine were trained to keep treating and keep going. I, I did a lot of oncology rotations. There was a lot of kind of giving chemo up until the end. And in medicine, we, we weren't really trained, still are not really well trained to help people sort of deal with this very difficult and for many final phase of their lives. Um, but a lot of people you ask as to would, would like to die at home or in a hospice setting. And I saw a good death when I was a teenager. My mom was a hospice worker in Los Angeles. She took me with her and I saw this kind of beautiful thing of people dying, um, making meaning out of life, being connected to others. And But in American medicine, this is more of the norm that people die in hospital settings much more than they should. Uh, they're not able to come to terms with death and our system is not really well geared to this concept of a, of a helping occasion a good death, which has to do with you do a careful life review, which we do, uh, which we did in our cancer study. You get someone to really think of the totality of their life from the be very beginning up until now to really frame what they're going through with their cancer. You really want to focus on uh, pain and symptom management. The concept and issues of spirituality and meaning become very important to individuals. And again, I just had no training to be able to have any of these kinds of discussions, you know, other than like you call for a clerical consult in the hospital. You want to help patients resolve conflicts and have a sense of completion in the remaining time they have and to spend quality time surrounded by loved ones to make clear decisions and to really prepare for death um, uh, in a good way. <clears throat> this is a review article that I published a couple years ago that really helped me think of this body of research. So the first wave of research was the 60s to the 70s. There were two programs. One was at University of Chicago, um, run by Eric Kast. Uh, and this really focused on uh, patients in inpatient settings. 
And the other was a, an outpatient model, which really was the first to develop this two therapists for one participant, uh, lots of preparation, lots of monitoring, supervision during sessions, and then a lot of integration afterwards. Uh, and Cast was this kind of really amazing guy. He was um, a, from Vienna, his family escaped persecution. He made his way to Chicago. He was trained as a psychiatrist and a pain uh, researcher. He was an internist, and he was interested in helping end-of-life uh, patients with end-of-life cancer who had refractory pain syndromes. He heard about this drug LSD made by Sandoz, and he ordered some up. And his model was a chemotherapeutic model that um, you're going to give them this drug, and will it help their pain? Uh, and it was sort of amazing. He gave it to hundreds of patients with very little preparation or integration. Kind of, kind of crazy to think about that. These were like end-of-life patients, uh, refractory pain in a hospital setting, dying. Um, and this was the first uh, body of research, followed by this outpatient model that was developed at Spring Grove, uh, a collaboration between University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. And what they found, and this was hundreds of, of patients, single dose LSD, and again, all open label, no randomized control trials. They didn't get to that point, but they uh, found acute and short term sustained reductions in pain from single dosing. They found decreased depression and anxiety, and they also were the first to discover reductions in uh, death anxiety, the, that there was maybe existential therapeutic components to this intervention. They wanted to take this open label research and do controlled trials, but that's sort of when the music all came to a stop and, um, yeah, Richard Nixon declaring war on drugs. So this body of research has um, reemerged in the last two decades with phase one to two studies. There's been some work with LSD in Europe, a pilot study that was published in advanced cancer and other medical disorders. But then there was a coordination between uh, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, and NYU to conduct uh, three pilot trials. Uh, and I went to UCLA for medical school, although I never met Charlie Grove when I was there. And even though he was at my favorite hospital, he was at Harbor UCLA, which is kind of like the Bellevue of UCLA, this um, hospital dedicated to the poor. But I didn't meet him when I was there, but I was introduced to him a, a couple years after graduating when I heard about this. And he really encouraged me to get involved in this research. I met Roland Griffiths, traveled down to Johns Hopkins, and, and he uh, was also instrumental in helping our group. So um, we, we really got a lot of help to get our program started. Charlie's study was published in the Archives of General Psychiatry, now JAMA Psychiatry in 2011. This was a pilot, 12 participants. The dose he used was lower than ours. It was 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. He was able to establish feasibility, safety, and and some signals around anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. And then 2016, uh, Johns Hopkins and our group uh, published in the same journal of psychopharmacology uh, two pilot trials, very similar design. The Hopkins study um, had 51 participants, and our study had 29. So together, the three studies had a, a combined end of 92. The design of our study was single dose psilocybin versus an active placebo, which was niacin, uh, as a way to try to blind the effects of psilocybin to a degree. Uh, there were two therapists, there was extensive preparatory psychotherapy, the, the model that I previously described, uh, where we would review the history of cancer, the distress associated with cancer. We would contextualize that in getting the story of their lives. We would look for elements that had to do with meaning and impaired meaning. Um, the dosing sessions happened, occurred in a clinical research setting um, with a lot of safety monitoring. And then there was a, a period of uh, seven weeks of integration. And then there was a crossover. This was designed as a crossover. So the two groups crossed over, single dose, and we followed them another 26 weeks. The primary outcomes were depression and anxiety, but 
We also looked at existential distress, quality of life, spirituality, and we measured the mystical experience using the MEQ. Uh, I'm a, a Bellevue guy, you know, but Bellevue wouldn't let us do the study here. So it actually occurred at the NYU College of Dentistry of all places. They reached out to us and we teamed up with our cancer center, the Perlmutter Center at NYU. So the patients were mostly women, mostly Caucasian. The typical patient was a woman in her mid fifties that had a um, advanced uh, gynecologic cancer stage three and four were the most common. And essentially these were people with adjustment disorder with um, anxiety or anxiety and depression. These were not people that had long-standing chronic mental illness. This was a population of people that really developed psychiatric and existential distress in the face of advanced cancer. In terms of AEs, um, these were expected AEs. We knew that psilocybin has some pathomimetic effects so that there were not clinically significant elevations of blood pressure. Uh, psilocybin is associated with more headache and, and some nausea. We did find transient anxiety and very difficult experiences that uh, people would have. Often this would be when they would have some kind of breakthrough, that they would have an experience of their, their death or cancer that was frightening and we would encourage them to kind of like go towards the fearful thing and often those would be transformative moments in these sessions. Um, but some individuals had transient psychotic-like phenomena which resolved. But like the, the extant literature that I mentioned, there were no SAEs, either medical or psychiatric. And I really was worried that, uh, even about doing this study, that you know, I was very worried you would take an anxious dying cancer patient and, and give them some bad experience, make them more anxious. So I, I was, um, uh, it was good to know that we could do this safely. Um, and in terms of outcomes, this really surprised me. So what we found, this is the niacin first group, this is the psilocybin first group. We found these sort of rapid reductions. The HAZ is a measure of anxiety and depression. So there were acute reductions in anxiety and depression, a big separation between the control group. This is single dose, it endured at seven weeks at the crossover. And you can see the niacin group gets psilocybin here and their scores start to come down. If you look at this graph here, they sort of become isomorphic by the end. But, but really the most important finding was that psilocybin was a rapidly acting anxiolytic and antidepressant that lasted at least seven weeks but the suggestion was it could have lasted longer, upwards of six and a half months from a single dosing. So this was sort of intriguing. Hopkins found something similar. This was five weeks um, after dosing. This was before the crossover. There's a big separation between the psilocybin uh, and, the, and the active control group in terms of depression. At the end of the study with both groups having received psilocybin, they converge. Same thing with anxiety. So very similar to us, very similar effect sizes, uh, and made us think that you know this may be a real effect, that two independent studies found that. Looking at clinical significance, we looked at depression remission rates and found very high rates of depression remission one day after with the psilocybin group versus placebo, which endured at seven weeks right before the crossover. And then both groups approach each other by the end. Uh, Hopkins found similar data in terms of depression and anxiety in terms of uh, clinical, clinically meaningful outcomes and responder status. In addition, we found that uh, we, we measured the demoralization syndrome using the demoralization scale. And we found that psilocybin produced reductions between groups significant differences between the psilocybin group and the placebo group. We found the same thing for hopelessness in cancer. We found improved spiritual well-being with psilocybin. We were able to find some improvements in quality of life. And we did measure the mystical experience, and this wasn't surprising. The, those that got psilocybin had much higher MEQ scores versus placebo. We also did a mediation analysis. So we looked at the MEQ seven hours after dose and we looked at anxiety and depression six weeks after dose. 
and we did find that there was um, some mediation, that it appeared that the mystical experience uh, total score in some way mediated anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. So, and Hopkins found this as well. So, so this experience emerged as a kind of candidate psychological mechanism of action. We did two qualitative studies as well that um, really sort of suggested that the nature of the experience and the confrontation with cancer and facing death um, and finding meaning were important things that helped participants come to terms with cancer and move forward. We did a long-term follow-up. We followed patients out to four and a half years. About half had died. And so, you know, at this point, everything has collapsed between into one group pre-post. But we found enduring um, reductions in anxiety and depression four and a half years later. When we asked if people in the intervening years had had psychotherapy or medication for anxiety or depression and cancer, almost nobody had. And participants attribute their enduring benefit to the psilocybin experience. We also found long-term reductions in existential distress, like demoralization and death anxiety. And when we queried the participants about how spiritually significant and meaningful it was, these were listed among the most meaningful, memorable spiritual experiences of their life. Uh, and this further made us think there's something going on about these experiences that are important. And, and participants would say, I can remember that day very clearly when I meditate about it, when I hear certain music. And a lot of them said that it kind of opened a door for them, that they were in a stuck state and it allowed them to get unstuck and to then engage in new behaviors that, um, that sort of helped them come to terms and cope with cancer. We recently published a secondary analysis looking at suicidality. Um, we were interested in this because we know that um, cancer patients are at heightened risk of suicide and there are no um, medication interventions for this. So we, we didn't take a population of people that were suicidal. In fact, we ruled out more serious forms of it. So the study was not designed nor powered to look at suicidality, but we did uh, measure suicidality and about 11 of the participants had some baseline suicidal ideation. And we found here significant within-group reductions acutely and out to seven weeks in the psilocybin first group, uh, but not the niacin first group. There were not significant between-group differences um, here, but when we looked at loss of meaning, this subcomponent of the demoralization syndrome, which is associated with hastened desire for death, we did find between-group differences between the psilocybin and the niacin group. And we, when we collapsed everything into one group, we did find significant pre-post reductions, suicidal ideation from baseline to six and a half months. And, and the loss of meaning construct, a kind of proxy for hasten desire for death, uh, we did find these sort of long-term improvements. Um, and we looked at the loss of meaning subscale of the demoralization syndrome, and we're able to find that it correlated with suicidal ideation and kind of developed a, an idea here that, that maybe if psilocybin is reducing suicidality, maybe it's doing it through improving existential distress and, and helping with this meaning construct. So th this is a very small study, lots of grains of salt. It, to look at psilocybin and suicidality, we'd have to design a trial specifically to, to answer that question that was sufficiently powered. So, in summary, we were able to demonstrate safety and feasibility. We were able to um, show that psilocybin was a rapidly acting anxiolytic and antidepressant that led to highly significant clinical outcomes with sustained antidepressant and anxiolytic effects that were anywhere from several months to several years, knowing that we didn't design the study to really attribute causality all this time later that it potentially was a rapidly acting and sustained anti-suicidal drug, that it improved existential distress, in particular demoralization syndrome, that it had some positive effects on reducing death anxiety, it improved quality of life, and these were highly spiritually significant and meaningful experiences, and that the mystical experience, as strange as it 
can sound talking about it in medicine emerged potentially as an important reason why patients may have improved. The study ended up landing on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. There were a dozen um, supporting um, editorials, including two former presidents of the APA. And most um, of the commentators said that this is interesting, it's very early, uh, but this body of research should continue uh, and done in a careful way. And so since then, I, I have been trying to take this program of research and to, to turn it into the sort of next level of things. And it's been frustrating because um, NIH, even though NIH supported the first phase psychedelic research, it was near impossible to get NIH funding for the research over the years, although that seems to be changing now. Uh, the idea is, uh, and I think we have to look very skeptically at these findings. They, they almost look too good to be true. You know, the saying in psychopharmacology, use a medicine early on in research because the effects can fade when you do really large scale trials. So I, I think they're promising, but we have to be skeptical. To really get at the truth, we need to do much bigger trials, uh, phase 2B and 3. In addition to that, we also need to look at early stage cancer, that early stage cancer have as high rates of psychiatric and existential distress as end of life. And, and here you have um, an opportunity to really intervene early in the stage of the illness rather than waiting until people have serious forms of psychopathology. Um, but in addition to cancer, cancer was kind of like the proof of concept component, but there's no reason to think that existential distress is unique to cancer. It, it definitely cuts across other medical disorders, and so from a broader perspective, it would be important to look at all life-threatening and end-of-life medical conditions, and, and I think very important to tack back and look again at pain uh, in cancer to follow up on the Eric Kast work. So just to give some updates of research that we are planning at NYU, um, <clears throat> I applied to the NCI to, for an R01 in this area, teamed up with our cancer center, UC Denver. Uh, in fact, today and tomorrow, study section is meeting to review the study or re-review it. We, we, came, we got close to a fundable score the last time to do a trial of 200 participants uh, that would be multi-center. So, you know, we're, we're waiting to see what will happen there. But NCI put on a psilocybin speaker series back last April. So, and, and NIDA and NIMH just put on a, a conference in January. So there appears to be an openness uh, at NIH. And NIMH recently funded a psilocybin for OCD, K award at Yale, and NIDA just funded a, a U01 given to Matt Johnson and Hopkins to study psilocybin and tobacco addiction. So it, it appears that, that NIH is now interested in this area. To take a drug all the way through, you know, um, academic studies can only go so far. Biotech uh, are the ones that, that do this. So there's a biotech company that uh, NYU has teamed up with uh, to in terms of drug development, the idea is to do a dose response study, which has not been done uh, in this patient population. And there was a pre IND meeting in November um, <clears throat> where th there appeared to be a path forward here. Although the demoralization syndrome is not in the DSM, making it a kind of novel diagnostic and, and kind of difficult entity to study because of that. Um, and that's going to be a multi center study led by NYU. Um, I have also teamed up with our breast cancer center, and we are um, going to be uh, submitting another R01 to NCI to look at early phase cancer. And, and here we're really looking at this concept of fear of recurrence that occurs in upwards of 50% of women with breast cancer um, and, and is a really high unmet need. There are no pharmacologic interventions. So this is kind of getting a more early stage illness. And then to look at um, palliative care more broadly, uh, Charlie Grobe at UCLA uh, has a funded trial, and he's teamed up with a couple centers, including our own, to do a trial of 100 participants, any end-of-life uh, medical condition. It could be 
um, <clears throat> end stage uh, cancer, it could be heart disease, renal disease, as long as there's the demoralization syndrome. And there's an open label study about to start at Dana Farber in this area. So, so this really opens it up very broadly to be studied um, across palliative care conditions. And then the, I have a new pilot study that is funded through our center. Uh, I looked at the CAST work and decided that the next stage there would be a randomized control trial. So I designed a study, um, a pilot study, and submitted to uh, EpicNet, which is part of the HEAL initiative to uh, study LSD to treat uh, pain in advanced cancer, with pain as the primary outcome, and to study it in a population of patients that are also uh, using opioids. We, we tend to kind of not focus too much on the use of opiates in cancer pain, but the outcomes can be just as bad, and, and the inappropriate prescribing can be there as well as, as you know, one of the root causes of the opiate epidemic is inappropriate prescribing of opiates for non-cancer pain syndromes. But in cancer, you can have quite bad outcomes with opiates as well. So the idea is also to look at opiate sparing, a psychiatric and existential distress. And the funding historically had been through philanthropy and some through nonprofit, but really the goal is to get NIH. That's really the best way to look at that, uh, uh, to fund these trials, and, and ultimately to have this kind of public-private partnership around drug development. Um, and, and also, if in addition to figuring out efficacy and effectiveness, we, we really have to understand mechanistically how they're working. So this is kind of just a model that I put together, that either it has something to do with the unique psychospiritual effects, and we should take a look at that by measuring MEQ. We know psychedelics also uh, lead to long-term changes in, in personality structure, like openness. We know they can improve cognitive flexibility. So these may be other psychological mechanisms of action, but their effects on neuroplasticity, brain connectivity, and also there's some interesting uh, evidence that they have potent anti-inflammatory effects. That these may be ways that, uh, if we can figure out that they do work, the kind of how uh, and the mechanisms behind it. And we'll have to see what happens, but if uh, pivotal trials can prove efficacy, it sets up the historic potential rescheduling from Schedule 1 to something like 2 or 3. There have to be a, a really important regulatory framework to optimize safety and efficacy. There'd have to be, um, it probably would be constrained by the REMS program. You really may need to make sure that therapists are skilled and mature and well-trained to do this. There really needs to be a quality control oversight, like having something like JACO. And the settings you could imagine could be things like hospice settings, palliative care settings, cancer centers. And issues of um, insurance coverage, reimbursement would have to be worked out. And all this to, to make sure that uh, if this is disseminated, it's done in a just way, and particularly that those uh, that are most vulnerable and can least afford it are able to access it. So I, I'm going to stop there. I um, was going to mention a little bit about our alcohol study, but we're, we're out of time and uh, don't want to get into that. So I wanted to thank everyone for their time and, and see if we have any time for questions. Why don't you go ahead with questions, folks, because we do, you know, some people can stay beyond four, so. I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, you mentioned LSD at the very end, and this area seemed to get started by LSD, thinking it might have a role in these areas. And uh, what would you compare to as a study candidate between LSD or psilocybin or so the others? How do you? Um, well, LSD and psilocybin are similar that they're both 2A agonists, but they're, they're quite different. LSD has uh, greater pleiotropic effects. It has more significant dopaminergic effects than psilocybin. It's a direct D1 and D2 agonist. Um, it, it has uh, effects at uh, serotonin receptors beyond what psilocybin has. So um, it's a longer acting drug. It's about 100 times more potent than psilocybin. It, it, I, as I kind of contemplating doing the LSD study, trying to figure out how we fit it into a nine to five day. 
uh, but the historical era, they did it in tens of thousands of people. So, yeah, so they're they're similar but but different, and they may be different in important ways. One of the guys I worked with in, in a he was a, a supervisor when I was a therapist was Jerry Clee, Clee who had done uh, LSD experiments at Fort Detrick, Maryland, where they were testing it for chemical warfare. You know, put it in the water and you know, disable the troops. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that. It's like sort of Curious of you. I saw some of those videos. The military, through their MK Ultra program, tried to weaponize psychedelics, and yeah, they wanted to put in the water. I, I think the CIA was working with Yale to develop an LSD bomb and all kinds of right. unethical stuff. I, I don't think. Uh, right. I don't think they're working on that anymore. They closed yeah. that program. I, I think they got in a lot of trouble on that when I oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. it to. The people who they weren't telling me about it, but I was just curious. Some other questions for Steve? Yeah, actually, I, I have a question. Hank? Yep. Hi, and Steve. I also have a question. Hey, hey, Hank, nice to see you. It's been a while. You too. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so the the two drugs that I see uh, most <clears throat> often described um, in companies uh, that are working in this space, there are a lot of startups, and and you may have seen the uh, the editorial like or the commentary um, in JAMA Psychiatry recently about the about the the, the pivot uh, by industry uh, to develop uh, psychedelic drugs. But the two drugs are DMT and psilocybin. Um, obviously, ketamine. I mean, ketamine is is as ketamine is approved, and and and. Uh, but so, how would you compare DMT and psilocybin? They're both 5-HT2 acting drugs. DMT is shorter acting than psilocybin. Uh, um, so, if you look at uh... DMT and psilocybin, they're very, very similar. They're both tryptamines. Their chemical structure is almost identical. The difference has to do with the route of administration. So if you um, smoke DMT, it lasts about 10 to 15 minutes. It creates this very bizarre experience that's very colorful and people describe seeing entities. Um, if you were to- uh, Businessman's use... lunch. Exactly, exactly. So. Right. But if you use DMT and ayahuasca, it's just like psilocybin. You, you have an MAO inhibitor that prevents uh, gut degradation. It lasts about six hours. So the preparation, the route of administration, uh, and the length of time very much are important. But some drug companies, they're, they're also trying to develop 5-MEO DMT. And what they're trying to do is they don't like the six-hour, eight-hour thing, two therapists. That's, like, too expensive. They want something quick that you can inhale or inject IV that lasts 10 minutes that cures depression and you can make a lot of money. And I think you have to be very careful with that kind of model. I think you can get into trouble. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, your presentation. I'd like to ask a question that you didn't uh, essentially mention anything about, and that is your source of product. The psilocybin can come in an organic uh, form and also in a synthetic. And I was wondering if you noticed whether there's any difference whatsoever in the activity of the synthetic psilocybin versus uh, the entourage effect, which I've I've heard about, which may be part of the organic product. Ours was all synthetic. Uh, it was not derived from the mushroom. That there. The mushroom has more alkaloids. Um, the only psychoactive one, and, and Albert Hoffman also discovered this in 19, the mid-1950s, he got samples of psilocybin, isolated all the alkaloids, self-ingested, and came up with psilocybin as the main ingredient. And actually, psilocybin is a prodrug. It gets cleaved to psilocin, which is active in the CNS. But yeah, similar to ca cannabinoids, it may be that there are differences between the ingested mushroom and the synthetic version. We've not studied that, though. Other questions for Steve? Well, thanks, Steve, so much for taking time to present this wonderful area of research.
We may drag you back after you get your alcohol study published. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to, and I'd love to do it in person. I would, would so be so great to visit Penn again. It's been a couple of years, and uh, I yeah. just love Penn. Yeah, we all, we all wish. Keep your fingers and every other appendage crossed. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Take Thanks, care. Everybody. Thanks Have so much. Thanks again.